Well, hello everyone. Thanks for having me back. It is really nice to be back here. I really miss Tigberg a lot. Um, so this was quite a big, broad topic to talk about. Um, and I think I had a little bit of experience when I did physics um, primary for radiology. And one of the biggest bits of advice that I got when I was doing it was to not overthink things too much in the physics and kind of absorb it. And then later on, it kind of fits into place when you apply it. I've aimed this mainly at the part one candidates because it comes up quite a lot in the part one exams, mainly the part one B. So I had a look at the, at the blueprint and it looks like most of the blueprint is for ultrasound physics, which obviously is understandable, but it's definitely the most important. But then they are also want physics of x-rays, CT scans and MRI, which is quite a big task. So I've kind of condensed everything to give kind of a grounding and to try and understand it. But for the exam, you probably have to go and carry on reading just to add a little bit more so you can answer the questions. So starting with ultrasound, um, first, the most important thing is to ask why is it important to know about the physics of ultrasound. It's complicated, but number one, it can help you optimize your image quality, it can improve your diagnostic capabilities, and it maintains the safety of the mother and the fetus. Starting at the very beginning, you have to say what is a sound wave? So the most basic definition I can find is it's a mechanical vibration or disturbance that's propagated through a medium from one location to another. And the easiest analogy is to think of a slinky. So the slinky toy, and if your hand is the force or the motion or the energy on one side, and the slinky is the, the matter, and you can see that motion is propagated through, just like a sound wave. Or, alternately, looking at it with, with these particles, so each dot represents a particle. At the top, it's evenly distributed, and you have a small piston on the one side, which ultimately will represent your transducer. The piston moves to the right and causes an area of compression, then moves back again, causing an area of rarefaction or decreased compression, and continuously does this to make a wave that's propagated forward. So this at the top kind of looks similar to the slinky, um, but you can then translate this mathematically into a transverse wave, where the crests of the wave represent compression and the troughs represent decompression. And the amplitude, so up and down, represents how much that hammer moves or how much the, the piston moves. Very basic of ultrasound is where, what is wavelength. So it's important to note wavelength is a, a distance, and it's the distance traveled in one cycle. Or it's the distance between two identical points. So you can say the distance between the maximum compression to the next one. And it is inversely proportional to the frequency, which we'll understand why now. So frequency is the number of cycles of compressions and rarefactions of a sine wave per second. So you can see that illustrated in the top wave, we have a shorter wavelength. So we have more cycles in that one second timepiece. And below, we have a longer wavelength. So we have a decreased frequency. So it's inversely proportional to the wavelength. Amplitude and intensity, so it's the measure of degree of change in a medium, so how much uh, disruption the piston causes. So that's why I put the piston at the top right, so the piston's moving more up left right, causing a greater amplitude of the wave. It's the length of the oscillation of the particles, and the higher the amplitude, the more intense the sound. But why is all this important to know? So a smaller wavelength has got a higher frequency, it produces higher resolution, but it has less penetration. So a linear probe. Um, a higher wavelength has got lesser frequency, less resolution, and deeper penetration. So a curvilinear probe. Next important part is compressibility. So sound, veloc sound velocity is inversely proportional to the compressibility of the conducting material. So the less compressible a medium, the faster the sound wave will move through it. That's why sound moves quicker through solids compared to liquids compared to gases. And I look at the analogy with the slinky. If you keep the slinky closer together, the matter is closer to itself, so it's denser. And if you propagate a movement, it moves faster. The density, so dense materials like bone have large molecules with large inertia. So density is inversely related to the velocity. So if you look at air, and the velocity is 331, 
uh, meters per second, and then compared to skull bone is much increased. So the transducer is an important part of ultrasound, um, and quite a lot happens in the transducer, and it's when you realize how much happens, you realize why they are so expensive. So just ultra-transducer anatomy, the most important part being the piezoelectric crystal, which is the light blue. On either side are electrodes, and then a backing block. We'll come back to what each of them does and how it works. But a, a transducer does three main things. It generates an ultrasound wave, so it converts electric signal into ultrasound energy that can be transmitted into the tissue. And then it converts the ultrasound energy reflected back to the tissue into an electrical signal that you see on the screen. So zooming up on the piezoelectric crystal, the light blue element, and the fronts and the backs are connected to electrodes. So if you look at the first image A, that's just a normal piezoelectric crystal uncharged. It contains dipoles, which have a positive and negative charge within it. When you apply a charge across it, these poles align and the crystal increases in size. Then when you take that away, it changes back to another shape. So you can quickly change the shape of the piezoelectric crystal by applying a current across it. So this can be demonstrated. The red represents a piezoelectric crystal. You then, the switch is turned off. You don't have a current flowing across it but now you switch it on and the piezoelectric crystal increases in size, creating a wave below it. So with ultrasound machines, you have a high speed switch. So the red being the piezoelectric crystal, the black being a backing, a, the backing block, and it continuously switches on and off and on and off, producing the yellow waves. So now you've produced waves, but how can you hear what the waves are saying? So how can the piezoelectric crystal listen to what's coming back to it. So in the top picture, we can see um, the piezoelectric crystal is creating waves. And what we want to image is that maroon dot. And um, the waves hit the maroon dot and are pushed back towards the piezoelectric crystal and towards the crystal. And you can see this progression. As the wave approaches the piezoelectric crystal, so it's a bit small, but the voltage meter at the top changes because the piezoelectric crystal is compressed by the waves. And you can see it goes from voltage meter 1 to, to 3, to the maximum, as the waves become more compressed. So as the waves pass through the body, the echoes reflect back towards the transducer. The echoes carry the energy and transmit the energy to the crystal. They then cause compression of the crystal. The compression causes the, the dipoles to change their orientation and induces a voltage. This voltage is amplified and this produces the signal for display. And this happens multiple times, so you can see that's a transducer sending multiple waves down. So just going back, the backing block is really important because it stops the crystal vibration within a microsecond, and so that the crystal can go from creating sound waves to listening to sound waves coming back. How, next thing is how the waves received in the tissue. So a whole lot of things happen as a wave moves through tissue. Attenuation, refraction, reflection, and scattering. Attenuation is a reduction in the intensity of the ultrasound beam as it traverses matter. And this happens as the sound wave is converted to heat energy. Um, so the tissue absorbs some of the ultrasound waves, therefore less or no waves return back to the screen and nothing can be imaged. So this is more for deeper structures. So you can see on the, on the left, the image, the waves becoming less and less strong as attenuation occurs. Scattering. So small stu structures result in scattering of the ultrasound signal. And the beam is, beam is radiated in all directions. So you can see the red beams being pushed forward. They hit this very irregular yellow object. And the blue wave is reflected back to the transducer, and it's imaged. But the red waves are scattered away, and they're not imaged. Refraction and reflection. So each tissue has something called acoustic impedance. So it's a bit of a complicated thing to understand, but it's related to the density of the substance and the speed of the ultrasound in that substance. So when the ultrasound passes through two substances with different acoustic impedances, two things can happen. Number one, there's refraction. So part of the wave continues, but bends away. So that's in the pink. So not all of it will be imaged. And then reflection. So part of the wave is reflected back, and that is imaged. 
Artifacts, there are many artifacts in ultrasound, but some of the most important ones are shadowing, through transmission, reverberation, and refraction artifacts. So just to give you an example, shadowing, there's a signal void um, behind objects that strongly reflect or absorb ultrasound waves. Also, I'm showing the IOTA rules, the simple rules, you would have read that. There's post-acoustic shadowing on one of the, the, the benign rules. Through transmission, so there's increased echoes deep to the structures that transmit very well. Um, so this is a kidney with a kidney cyst, but it's a similar finding for a simple ovarian cyst as well. So you can see this increased intensity waves after the cystic structure. Reverberation artifact is a little bit more complicated to understand, um, but ultrasound assumes that a single pulse exits the transducer and is reflected back. But sometimes the wave is bounced between two parallel reflectors before returning. So this confuses the ultrasound machine, it confuses, and it interprets it as coming from different depths. And hence you get this reverberation artifact. And I remember I was in the neighborhood with an old machine, and sometimes I'll get this, and I'll blame the machine, but if you just change your angle, you can often uh, correct the artifact. Refraction artifact. Um, so this is non-linear bending of sound waves. Remember, refraction means the sound wave moves and then it bends. So the ultrasound machine assumes that the beam moves in a straight line, but it doesn't always. And therefore, does not correctly locate the edge of a bent beam, like in this um, cranial ultrasound or head ultrasound. So resolution is the ability of the, the ability to distinguish between two closely related structures, and it varies with frequency as inversely proportional with the wavelength. So smaller the wavelength gives you increased resolution but decreased penetration. There are two types of resolution to note, that being axial and lateral resolution. So axial resolution is the ability to distinguish structures that are in the same direction as the sound wave. So you can see those two dots, and you can see a very high frequency wave being shot at them, and you can see quite good resolution, axial resolution. But when you use a low frequency probe or low frequency wave, you can't really differentiate between those two dots, and they come out as one big blur. So obviously the better resolution is to increase the frequency. Lateral resolution is the ability to distinguish between two closely adjacent structures that are perpendicular to the sound waves. Um, and that will be changed by changing your focus. So the display, we've spoken about how we obtain these ultrasounds, but how do we put something on a display to give you an image on the screen? So electric signals of the echoes are amplified and then they are displayed on the monitor. The different types of modes, A, B and M, I'll just focus on B, which is brightness, but you should just know what A and M are for. So B mode, this is just a visual representation of, of what happens. So the black is the screen, um, and then you see the ultrasound probe shooting a wave, and the image to be structured, the structure that's going to be imaged is the round circle. So the ultrasound wave will be shot out, and it will be reflected back, but won't be that intense. And as it goes along, it hits this more dense structure, and it comes back as a brighter or higher voltage structure, which interprets as a higher signal, which will come out as, well, as a white dot. In the middle of the, of the circle, there's nothing. Then it hits the end of the circle, and it hits the, the other part, which is bright, and then nothing again. So this is repeated multiple times. So you eventually get an image that's created. Doppler, so color Doppler is an imaging test that uses sound waves to show blood uh, moving through the vessels. So just a bit of quick revision. Um, frequency. Remember, is the number of cycles per second. And we've highlighted here below is a low frequency and above is a high frequency. So four pink dots at the top and two at the bottom. When nothing is moving, ultrasound waves sends out a wave at a certain frequency and expects it back at a, at a certain frequency. Um, but what if the object is moving away or towards it? So Doppler ultrasound is hard to understand, but an easier visual representation is to think of the bottom object is moving towards it. So they're shooting a wave towards this object at a certain frequency, but this object is moving towards it. So the wave almost compresses, so the moving object almost compresses this wave, okay, and sends back a different frequency. In a similar vein, 
something moving away kind of stretches the wave. It doesn't really stretch, but you can think of it as stretching the wave. So it comes back at a, as a lower frequency. So putting that all together, um, you can see nothing moving on the top. Then you see something moving together, you get an increased frequency wave. And then you see at the bottom something moving away, a decreased frequency wave. So how the image is acquired is the normal ultrasound display image that I showed you earlier with the ring. But then if the ultrasound machine notices that something is moving, it'll superimpose the Doppler flow image on top of it, and you'll get flow. Um, so that's a very, very basic ultrasound approach that you can need to just build on and add other things to. X-ray. So X-rays are very similar to visible light. Um, they are forms of electromagnetic energy, and they are carried by particles called photons. And they are produced by the movement of electrons and atoms. How they penetrate the tissues creates an image, and they are used in CT and fluoroscopy and X-ray. So just a bit of a basic anatomy of, well, anatomy of an atom. So this, an atom has a nucleus, and it has got electrons flying around it. And there's quite complicated structures around the atom, and these different electrons floating around have got different energy levels. Okay, So when a particle hits an atom, it can displace one of these electrons to a higher <laughs> zone, a higher energy level. Okay, But afterwards, that electron moves back to its original orbit, <laughs> and it releases energy in the form of a photon that, is, that shoots out. So this is applied to X-ray. So you can see the X-ray machine, the X-ray box, just a very simple one. Um, it consists of a cathode at the top and an anode at the bottom within a vacuum. The entire device is encased in lead to prevent random scattered X-ray beam, beams. Um, the machine passes energy through the cathode and shoots elect electrodes to the tungsten anode, which is the bottom, which looks like a plate. And the reason it's a plate is that it spins around very fast because it generates an incredible amount of heat, and to decrease the amount of heat, the plate will spin. When it hits the tungsten anode, two things happen. The first thing I explained initially, so the electrons will hit or mist or dis will push another electron into a high energy level. It will then fall back to its original place on orbit, and it will shoot out the green photon, and that is the X-ray wave. Or it doesn't necessarily have to displace an atom, it can move close towards the nucleus, and you can see those green dots in the, over here moving around the nucleus and being changed direction, and that shoots out photons as well. And how that is interpre interpreted into an image, um, the small narrow window allows a narrow beam of X-ray to escape. And the X-ray film on the other side of the patient records the pattern of the X-ray light that passes through the tissues. Obviously, everything used to use film, but now everyone uses a digital display. Most x-rays can pass through tissue, but they are blocked by bone or metal. Um, and that's how you acquire a basic x-ray image. So CT is a much more complicated x-ray machine, if you think about it. It uses radiation. Um, it spins an X-ray source, as you can see there, in a 360 degrees around with, with detectors. And a patient is on a bed and it's moved through the X-ray machine. All modern CT scan machines use spiral acquisition. So they're continuously shooting a ray of X-ray beams with a detector around it. And there's a spiral acquisition. So it's not one 360 degree loop and then move. The patient can move quickly through the machine and the spiral acquisition picks up raw data, it puts it into a very complicated algorithm, and it creates slices. And that's how an X-ray picks up images. So MRI. Um, MRI uses magnetic fields and radio frequency. It's a type of quantum physics, so the study of small particles. And if there's ever time to kind of not question things and just accept it and it'll make sense later, it's probably with MRI. It can get quite complicated. So just the basic anatomy of an MRI machine. So the bore is the tube where the patient lies. Um, there is a supercharged magnet. 
On the inner surface are gradient coils, so magnet and gradient coils. So with regards to the strength of this magnet, the average magnet is about 1.5 Tesla, can go up to 3 Tesla for research purposes. I think there is one downstairs for a 3 Tesla. Um, an example of how strong it is, so 1 Tesla is 10,000 Gauss, I'm not trying to exactly to say it. The Earth magnetic field is 0.5 Gauss or Gauss, so it's an extremely strong magnetic field. Um, the magnet is made up of coils of wires that are bathed in liquid helium that can cost hundreds of thousands of rand. Um, a current is then passed through it, and hence it is a supercharged magnet. So, the body consists of many atoms, billions. Um, with MRI, we are only concerned with hydrogen atoms, um, which are abundant in the human body. These atoms are randomly spinning, but the proper way to say it is they are precessing. So you can see in image number one, those little, looks like apples on a stick, are spinning around and precessing. When they go into a magnetic field, which is number two, they start to align. And half, most, most half will go or face towards the top of the patient, and half will face towards the bottom of the patient. Um, but there will be some unmatched pairs and those are the green ones, and that's how the MRI image is derived. In image number three, a radio frequency is applied across the entire body, and these are only specific for hydrogen atoms, okay? So they will then put energy within those hydrogen atoms, and they will cause them to rotate or spin in a different direction. This is called resonance. So this is where the name comes from, resonance. When that radio frequency is removed, those unpaired atoms or unpaired hydrogen ions release the energy and that is picked up by the coils inside the MRI machine. There are also three other magnets within the main magnet, sorry, coils within the main magnet that can focus the area of study. And as you can see in the bottom right picture, there is this person with lots of atoms inside of it and the, those blue and pink represent the extra coils and they focus the MRI energy to a certain area and hence you can derive a slice. It derives this by gaining raw data and the raw data is then put into another complicated algorithm called Fourier transform and this generates an MRI slice image that you see in image number five. So that kind of outlines very basic physics that can take quite a long time to understand but I don't think you need to go into the hugest amount of detail, I think mostly ultrasound. Um, I know what I used when I studied it was watching YouTube videos, and I left at the end of this a whole lot of um, resources on up to date. One thing I haven't touched on, because I just don't think there's enough time, is safety in ultrasound and x-ray imaging, which there is an article that I've referenced here for on up to date on safety of ultrasound, which you can discover before the exams. But that's just a very, very broad outline. question last year on physics of MRI, <clears throat> and it took me much longer to set up the memorandum than to mark the question, because firstly it was difficult to set up the memorandum, and secondly all the answer sheets were empty. So, um, yeah, but I think maybe I can ask Jason, maybe give me a copy of his presentation, and then I can give it to the primary candidates that's preparing. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, any questions from anybody? Thank you. 
understand that in the future they still have to be here to send to the brain. Mm -hmm. Because if you if you put a lot of blood along the brain, the, the problem with the brain is there isn't a lot of blood flow mm -hmm. that actually pulls down the tissues and because it's right underneath the skull, the skull bone actually can heat up considerably. So it's not just the first time it's the issue and cardiac development, it's actually also throughout pregnancy, uh, especially in the context of childbirth. But uh, the other uh, risk is mechanical. The, the, the sound waves actually also compress and stretch cells and, and you can actually have micro bubbles within the cells and that can actually be also a source of damage. Now with diagnostic equipment that seems to be less of a concern and uh, but it, it can of course uh, happen with therapeutic use of ultrasound. Uh, so the main concern is, is, is temperature problems and you must be aware that it's not just a baby pregnancy concern between the last two months. Yeah, that's part of the responsibility of the user to not only scan, but to know the limits and the risks involved. Um, I think this is Can I ask a general question about X-rays that you pass through, for instance, at the airport? Because I know that the dose you get from a diagnostic X-ray is extremely low. Um, how does that sort of type of x-ray compared to a diagnostic x-ray and how does that compared yeah. to a CT for instance? So it's extremely low. So I found out walking through those x-ray machines in the airport are equivalent to I think five minutes in the air of radiation. So it's an extremely, extremely low dose of x-ray. And what can they see on those x-rays? I mean, oh, not as, I think it's just picking up metal or um, I mean the ones that spin around. No, I, I know. know. Oh, okay. oh, those are the X-rays. I think it just picks up, it picks up metal. I know the ones that I've seen where they actually kind of scan your body because I looked at them afterwards. And they actually pick up an image of your entire body. But I went and looked, and it apparently the, the radiation is negative or as much as a few minutes of flying. And 
is the view frontier 3D. Um, we said equally as safe as. Yeah, it's actually not less safe uh, if you do 3D just uh, um, the imaging, right? Uh, if you do 3D now with uh, color, then the imaging will increase, so it just depends on which modes we do that. And you may all know or not know that uh, it became probably 15 years ago compulsory for all the companies to give the clinician constant feedback on how safe or unsafe you are working. Um, and on the screen, there are two things, a TI and an MI, um, and the one is the thermal index and the other is the mechanical index. And you should just not be just standing, but actually have to find those numbers as well. Because as soon as they approach one with an over, you should actually stop scanning, give it a rest, be able to reflect on the should continue uh, or not. So uh, in, in the past, nobody was aware. Some companies gave it to you, or it's in the machine that they don't tell you. And now it's actually compulsory to be on the screen so that you can actually see it all the time. And, um, so it's, it's really should be safety. And the reason is not because it's so dangerous, but because so many, 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 many million women and fetuses are exposed to it. You know, it's in Three. So we're going to do the recording at one. Three. Three o'clock. Okay, so this is it.